at Agape, I just feel it's not, you know, just a church where you walk in and you leave and no one notices. Um, I really feel like the people here are family and um, it's something that we're always hanging out together, we're always doing life together. So Agape is really a family-oriented church, you know. It's not a service that you just come to and, you know, get your word and then leave. So you come, you know, you meet people, you greet them, you all like get along well and you, you get in the Word of God together and then you go out and fellowship together. From the time we stepped in to the time we left, we were just overwhelmed with people. Just people fellowship, people welcoming us, people making us feel very comfortable, very much at home, very much like we were one. My favorite part about being in Agape is that um, I've never really heard the gospel the way that I've heard it here. And so it's different and it's just it's just so wonderful and it really it just really fills my soul. So I, I like this and I've not seen it anywhere else. My favorite thing about Agape is being able to serve and and help with the community and help with the church. Um, and I think just being able to, to serve and be in that spirit of service is, is the best part of being a part of the church. I think Agape is the greatest sense of family that you can get and uh, it's just a great sense of community that holds you accountable and really helps you grow in your faith and and also it's just a great group to be around and they're constantly just uh, supporting you. So at worship I play the drums and uh, so that I really enjoy that and I also uh, love being part of the band and it's a great, great time. So what I love about this church is the community and that we're all so close and always there for one another. Um, whenever someone's going through a rough time, you have like everyone there as a big community of sisters and brothers. I think that people should come and visit Agape because we have such an incredible, incredible and diverse group of people here. We have people from all over the world, all over the country, all over Texas, from different walks of life, different ages, and we all come together for one purpose, and that's to serve God and love each other. So I think it's a place that anyone can call home. Loving fellowship. Community. Family. Worship. Church. Love. Agape. Oh. Agape. 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 Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Agape. We're so excited to have you with us this morning. So if you could stand with me, and we'll start with prayer before worship. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning and for everyone who's here. Um, I thank you for bringing them all safely, for helping us through the week um, after a tough week that we've had. Lord, I pray that you bless this service, the people who are here and the people who couldn't make it, and that you just speak through the worship and the speaker um, and open our eyes and our hearts to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
open our eyes and our hearts to hear what you have to say, that you soften our hearts to accept what you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Good morning. I inadvertently became Pastor Eric, so I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... Uh, I want to, this morning, by the grace of God, to continue the, uh, uh, what we started with the, uh, with the Sermon on the Mount, and I would like you to uh, read with me this morning from that passage from Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> you remember last time we, we talked about... Uh, the blessed, the meaning of blessedness. Blessed are those. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then blessed are the meek who shall inherit the earth, the Lord said. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the word term blessed means happy are those. They will be blessed with the gift of joy from heaven. Those who live that kind of life. And you see if the way it's described, it's exactly opposite to the fallen human nature. Blessed, now you read, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall have, or shall they be shown mercy. You see, all of these beautiful kind of promises, and it starts the Sermon of the Mount, is a description of those people who have been transformed by the grace of God and have been born of His Spirit, cleansed by His blood, and have come into a knowledge of the living God and have become children of God. These people are going to be blessed beyond measure, beyond measure. It's you and I and, and each one of us, if we accept Christ as a personal Savior and live that kind of life, which is the Christ-filled life, there's going to be blessing despite of all the difficulties around us. And he keeps going on and on. You see, the happiness is something that the world has been looking for, has been searching for. But they're looking for happiness, and happiness is based in their mindset and our mindset on happenings. But the joy of the Lord is unconditional. It is not dependent on happenings around you. This is why the Apostle Paul from prison in Rome, he writes to the people of God and he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And that letter, the Philippian letter, that was written from prison, from a dungeon in the prison, where 50% of people who used to go into that prison would die in that prison. And ultimately, Apostle Paul was beheaded in that prison. He writes them the secret about the secret of joy. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And the word joy comes in in that letter 16 times. Brothers, sisters, joy, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And it's not dependent on happenings, on conditions around you. And here he puts a sort of a road map. For you, how to be a blessed man or a woman, and you can share, like Abraham, that blessing with people around you. We said last time that blessed are the poor in spirit. That is those people who consider themselves poor until they find all their treasure and all their wealth in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are bankrupt without Christ. And this is the state of manhood, of humanity, without Christ. We are morally bankrupt. We are spiritually bankrupt. We are condemned for eternal condemnation and judgment. But in Christ, we are blessed. And here it starts again with these other four promises. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Tomorrow, brothers and sisters, tomorrow is the 16th anniversary of September 11. A day that we can never forget. Many of you were so young, but some of us who were there, I remember heading to the clinic, and it, it, it was mind-boggling. In the beginning, we thought that first plane that really hit the tower, the first tower, that it was a mistake. Somebody is not, you know, wasn't, wasn't looking around. We, you know, it's like a car accident that happens on the highway. 
And we think, I think I was naive. You know, when I heard the news, they said, oh, no, a car hit that kind of tower. But the magnitude, the magnitude of, of ruthless hatred and, and merciless actions that took place on that day, this, the least of it we can, we can talk about is barbaric. And we continue to witness it since then on a daily basis in the Middle East and around the world, is mind-boggling. But two men on that morning, 8.45 the first plane hits, two men who were part of safety, one of them an, an engineer by the name of Frank Dumartin, and the other person is Pablo Ortez. Two men, good people. When they saw this happening and they were really on the ground floor, they started climbing up. You see, it hit, it did hit around the 90, 92nd floor. They went running up to see how can they save people on these upper floors. They got to floor 88. Obviously, the elevator is not working. Can you, can you imagine they climbed up 88 floors? And when they come to the floor 88, they find in a big room, 77 people are stuck within that room because the door, which is kind of iron made, has become, because of all the pressure and all the temperature that has come, was it's impossible to open. On the 88th floor, you know what they did? They went to the wall next to it. And they started carving an opening in that wall and cutting in that wall. And finally, after around 25 minutes, by the way, for the engineers here, it's good to have an engineer around. And within 40, around 25 to 30 minutes, they were open, able to open a hole in the wall nearby. And they led the 77 people out. They saved their lives. And then... The other plane hit on the other side. And the disaster was going on and on and on and on. And then the whole heat and the temperature, I mean, it was an incredible kind of a... They decided, rather than to run around after they allowed the 77th person to go down, they decided to go up to the 89th floor. They knew the risk. They calculated the risk. But they want to show a heart of mercy to the people who are burning and on fire. You see, the promises of the Lord are true. As it says, whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and someday will not be answered. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. If you live a life in Christ, that will show mercy to other people. The Lord will pour his mercy. This is why it says in the Psalms, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Brothers and sisters, I really want to congratulate you. I want to congratulate this agape congregation for the way you have shown mercy during Harvey. For those people who went out of their way and showed mercy and reached out to others and grabbed others and helped others. I know from Agape, a team went to, to one kind of place after the other and trying to fix places and homes that have been flooded, reached out to people who were evacuated. I want to thank the Lord for you, brothers and sisters. This is the way of the Lord, show mercy. What is mercy? What is mercy? Now, with mercy comes forgiveness. With mercy is that somebody who has hurt you, you're willing to forgive. But not even forgive, but really show graciousness where you go the other mile and reach out to that person and help him or help her. Remember Romans, that kind of beautiful kind of uh, verdict and state the verse in Romans where it says, if your enemy becomes hungry, go and feed him. Reach out to him. Brothers, show mercy, not only to the people you like and you love, but the people who hate you, who speak badly about you. Show mercy. Have a heart of mercy. Because this is, 
the basis of salvation. It's the mercy of God. Look what it says in Titus 3.5. For he saved us. Not because of our righteous ways or anything righteous we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing and rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Brother and sister, show mercy. You see, this is what he did on the cross for us. It was the ultimate act of mercy and grace. It was the ultimate act of unconditional sacrificial love. I remember from the story of the last emperor. You don't see it in the movie, but in the last emperor there is a conversation between a person who's a westerner and supposedly a Christian and speaking to the emperor. And he talks to the emperor and the emperor tells him, look, I here uphold justice. Whoever makes a mistake and is found to be at fault has to be punished. And then that person says, but your highness, O oh emperor, if you are found to be at fault, who would be punished? Would you be punished? And he looks at him, he says, no. Look at this man, he points to a slave. He says, I, if I do anything wrong, he will be punished on my behalf. And then there is a beautiful vase right next to him. He throws it on the ground and it's smashed. And then all of a sudden, a soldier starts beating on that servant. He says, he is now being punished on my behalf when I'm at fault. But that man looks at him and he says, you know what? My own emperor and the king of kings and the Lord of lords, when I was at fault, he was punished on my behalf. You see what it is, what mercy is? That king of kings and the Lord of lords took the form of a slave and a servant and was crucified on your behalf. Because we all have sinned and the wages of sin is death. See the magnitude of mercy that was shown to you. That is the basis for your salvation. And the Lord is saying, look what great mercy I've bestowed on you. Now my, as my children, as my ambassadors... Show that kind of mercy to people around you. You know, what is the magnitude of mercy that would be shown is somebody like Bin Laden, for example. If the United States would look, have looked at Bin Laden and said, okay, we decided to forgive you, this is exceeding mercy. But really it comes to the climax of the mercy that the word of God talks about or the grace that the Lord, the, Lord the, the scriptures talked about in the work of Christ on the cross. If they reached out to Bin Laden and said to him, well, we decided to forgive you. Rather than being a fugitive and we're deciding to kill you, we decided to forgive you. But then they would go and said, we're offering you citizenship in this country. Now I will tell you this, this will never have ever happened. But there was on the cross the meeting of both justice and mercy. Justice and mercy. The wages of sin is death. But death took place on the cross because somebody else was punished on your behalf. As it beautifully says in scriptures, I owe the debt that I could not pay. He paid the debt that he did not owe. It's a beautiful song. But it's the song of my Savior that I remember every day. Whoever, it says in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it will be given unto you. Then it says, For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Look, brothers and sisters, show that kind of mercy, and the Lord would put in your way people who have mercy. You know, help people. Reach out to people. Show unconditional love, and the Lord would put in your way nice people. I found it, you know, in my career at M.D. Anderson. You know, when I treat the people who respond to me with mercy and grace, all of a sudden I find that the Lord has given me grace in the people who are above me. You know, we got one time a boss who's the, the big head, and people said, uh, this man has no mercy. Beware of him. 
And the Lord gave, him, gave us grace in the eyes of these people who are not known to be merciful, but the Lord has shown grace for surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. I remember the story of the Titanic, the great Titanic, the ship that will never sink. This is how they used to kind of refer to it. But when it fell apart, and it was kind of the people were drowning, and people were crying, only they had 20 lifeboats, safe boats, and each would kind of fit, it had almost 2,000 people on board, and each of these lifeboats would fit around 15 people, max. They filled them with the people in first class. The people in second class and third class and fourth class on the deck, they wouldn't have no places for them, and they were left crying out, but you know what? All of these boats moved out with these rich people, but there was one boat that had a lot of Christians, true Christians who love the Lord. And when they moved out in the sea and they said, one of them said, brothers, sisters, we cannot move out hearing the cry of these people who died. Let's go back. And another person told him, well, if you go back, you're going to die with them. He said, but let's go back. Because this is what the Lord wants. It was boat number 14. Had many true believers, and they went back and picked up and picked up more people and more people they can pick up. And they went loaded. But I tell you, this boat of mercy reached the shore, and all of the people were saved, whereas the other ones who were so selfish, some of them did not reach their ultimate destination and drowned later on. Show mercy, brothers. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. But then look at the second verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Look, our God is a holy God. The Lord is pure and blameless. And you know what? If you want to be in fellowship with him, if you want to see him, if you want to come close to him, you have to have a pure heart. And you cannot purify your own heart. This is why David said it so beautifully in Psalm 51, 10. 10 Create in me, O Lord, a pure heart and renew a steadfast and righteous spirit within me. He has to do this. And this happens when you accept the Lord as a personal Savior. He cleanses your heart. And here it's not this pump. But it is kind of your spiritual inner being. He cleanses you from within with his blood. And then you can see the true Lord. But you understand today, brothers and sisters, that people are now, because of this wicked heart that we have, after the fall, something happened to whole, to whole humanity. Is that we developed a wicked, depraved heart. It's in nature, a fallen nature in you and me, but it's there in all humanity and it's unchecked by the Spirit of God and it's not kind of being cleansed. And this is why people with that kind of heart, without the Lord, they cannot see the true God. They come to us and say, all oh, this is a myth. No, 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 it's a myth. The true God should be different. And, and many of the gods you see created by world religion, what you find it is a reflection of their own imagination and their own kind of a dark heart. The God is frightening. It's full of anger many times, unpredictability. Many times it's an impersonal God. It's a God or multiple gods that you cannot kind of a is a reflection of humanity itself, the fallen nature, a cruel God, a treacherous God, unpredictable. But people cannot see the true God unless their hearts are cleansed. Is your heart cleansed? Now, brothers and sisters, this is the prayer you pray when you accept the Lord as a personal Savior. But it's the daily prayer that you should pray every morning. I learned to pray it every morning. Oh, Lord, create me a clean heart. Because you see, if you look at the cycle of, a, the, way of the way our hearts function, every minute it's being cleansed by the blood 
the clean blood coming from the lungs. And it goes into the heart. It goes into these coronary arteries. Where is Alex? Where are the people in medicine here? They understand. So it goes into these arteries and cleanses the heart. The job of the blood coming, the clean blood coming from the, uh, from the lungs. Jane will understand. They were coming from the lungs. It would cleanse the heart. And this is exactly what happens to us on a daily basis. The blood of Christ would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But keep that blood flowing. You know what happens in a heart attack? A clot sits in one of these coronary arteries that are supposed to be cleansing through the blood, the clean blood, the heart. A a clot comes in, and this is how you have a heart attack. The same is true in the life of a believer. A sin would come in, in the form of a clot, and would stop the flow of the blood of Jesus Christ. It could be lust. It could be anger. It could be lack of forgiveness. It could be enmity. Something that would stop the blood from flowing and keeping your heart clean. So every day, come and confess your sins. Or if anything happens, confess your sins and ask for the cleansing of the heart. So that can you live a pure life with mercy and grace. In James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. This is what happens when you accept Christ. And then purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded. Many times we live this schizophrenia. We have the mind of the world. And we want to have the mind of Christ. And there is the inner struggle. But you have to have one mind. One mindset. The mind of Christ. In Ezekiel 36, 26, he says, I will give you a new heart. And put in you a new spirit. I will remove from you the heart of stone and will give you a heart of flesh. Isn't this heart transplantation? This is spiritual heart transplantation long before the Debeke. And John Bernard, who started the kind of heart transplantation. This is the spiritual heart transplantation depicted with the work of Christ. What happens on the cross. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The the next one is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Isn't that beautiful? If you have Christ in you, you're a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker, brothers, sisters. Be peacemakers. People who don't know the Lord, they not only are at enmity with other people, and they are at enmity with God, but they like to create conflict. I was having lunch with a professor who taught me, was in medical school, and he told me, Dr. Salem, he told me, you know what, I want to tell you a story. He said, there is a, there is a guy, there is a person in our, in our country who used to love to create conflict between people who are close to each other, between friends. He likes to kind of tell people about each other. He finds a conflict. He would exaggerate that conflict and create more conflict. But the people of God are the peacemakers. They like to bring people together. If somebody comes and talks to you about somebody else, try to convince that person that that other person is not really that bad. And when you go to that other person, tell him, you know, this person is really good. And you can have a good relationship with with him or with her. Brothers, be peacemakers. For these are when they you act like a peacemaker because you have the Prince of Peace in your heart. People would look at you and realize that these people are different. These are the children of God, the sons and daughter of the living God. They can tell you by your own fruit. Isaiah 57, 20 to 21. But the wicked are like a tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Isn't this this description of the world? Look, I like history. I wanted to become a historian, but... uh, My dad convinced me that, uh, you know, my character more fits into medicine. But I I love history. It's my hobby. My hobby is to read history. I mean, I have free time 
besides the Bible, I love to kind of watch the History Channel. And you know, when you read history over the last 4,000 years, it's agreed on. 92% of the time, 3,700 years, were spent in major wars be between big powers. 92%, you know the other 8%, were not free from war. There were conflicts, but between small powers. It's like my home country of origin, Lebanon, having a war with one of its neighbors. It's small, small scale. But majority of the time, it was the big powers fighting. I mean, we were having big time. This is 92% of the time over the last 4,000 years. Find me a country in the world where it's at peace, good peace with its own neighbor, where there is no conflict and no enmity. Find me. Every time you find a union, you find a conflict within the union. And you start from South Korea to North Korea, and I can go up the map with you. With you. There it's, you have a restless spirit. And that's the Lord comes within. Even within families. Unless the Lord reigns on your heart. This is why I want to tell you, for those of us who have not chosen a better half, Choose somebody who truly loves the Lord and do not accept someone unless they know Christ, not only as their personal Savior, but as the Lord of their lives. Because if at the throne of your heart is Christ and the throne of the other person is Christ, Christ cannot be in conflict with himself. But if it's ego reigning in your heart and ego is reigning on the other person's heart, there will be conflict. Or if it's Christ versus the ego, that is a believer, goes kind of a, basically in this relationship with a non-believer, there would be conflict all the time. Because ego cannot coexist with Christ. So the Lord is calling you to be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. And that peace comes when you accept Christ. When you accept Christ. Listen, brothers and sisters, it says here so clearly in Romans chapter 5, 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The beautiful verse in Ephesians says, For he himself, Christ, is our peace, who has made the two groups and destroyed the barrier. He's talking about between the Jews and the Gentiles. Look. When there is, there is no more enmity. It says he crucified with his cross the enmity. There is no enmity between races. You know, all through when you read history, there is a struggle. It's a restless spirit between nations. People cannot live without having an enemy. You know what? Somebody said that we're a, we're a package of the people in our mind. There is the people we love and the people we hate. And there is in between the people who you feel neutral about. Now search yourself carefully. You'll find that there are people who sit on your nerves and you like to kind of stay away from. Search yourself. And there's the people who you really love. And the people who re you really love, you know, no matter what they say and how awkward they say it, and no matter what they do and how terrible it is, you always minimize it. He says, no, 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 they didn't mean it. They're nice people. But the people you hate, Whatever they do, even if it's a small fault, that you would excuse it for yourself and for your loved ones. It's kind of the end of the world. You know, somebody came to my office like last, uh, last Friday, actually. He said, what do you think of that person's behavior? I said, well, that person, his house was flooded, one of my faculty. And he was under stress. Oh, didn't you see what he did? I said, yeah, but he got sick. And then he tried to come to you. No, no, but you knew... I said, calm down. I lived with that person now for 20 years. And I like that faculty. And I would like to kind of uh, calm down. No, 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 we should do something about it. What, what can we do? Bring transplant? I told him, unless the Lord would change his heart. I mean, the, but what can we do? I mean, he's a human being. He was upset with all of us. His house got flooded and he was on duty. I mean, he had the right. I mean, he got sick. We tried to kind of cover for him, but he wanted more care. And I think he's partially right. 
No, I'm sorry. Now I'm just kind of, let me move back, back here. So, so brothers and sisters, <clears throat> be men and women of peacemaking, of reconciliation. The man is at enmity with God himself. And this is why he's at enmity with people around him. Augustine said it so beautifully that God, you created us unto yourself. And our spirits are so restless and so agitated until we find our rest in thee. But the war is over when you come to Christ. There is no more enmity with God. You're now an adopted child of God. You see, you have to find that people, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray, but we also have become rebels in the eyes of God. We hate the true God deep inside. We resent God after we have fallen. And humanity is in that situation. But when you come to Christ, there is a reconciliation. God now is a father. Not only the judge of the world, but is a father. Not only a creator, but he's your father. And the war is over. And then you become a peacemaker. And then you would have peace in troubled times because the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would protect your heart and mind in the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, blessed are those. Blessed are those who are persecuted. For there of righteous for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look, and he keeps going on. He says, "Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven." It says here, "Blessed are those when blessed are those who are when people insult you, or persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil, false things against you because of me." Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now here there is a blessedness for the children of God, especially who are under persecution. But there is something that in the beginning it looks scary. Look at this verse, Philippians 1.29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. 2 Timothy 3.12 In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, brothers and sisters, we live in a bubble here in the West. We live in a bubble. Reality is, if you really live, want to live a godly life, you're going to find people, whether it's in the workplace, people other places, or you're going to be see believers that are being persecuted. People will mock you. People will look down at you and say, what happened to that person after you believe? And if they don't do that, maybe you should check. Are you really living that life? Are you daring to be a Daniel? But if you declare your faith, you should count the cost of being a disciple of Christ. For the Lord said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple should deny himself or herself and take up his cross and follow me. Do you understand? The cross is the pain involved in doing the will of God. And it should, in Luke it says, should pick it up on a daily basis. Brothers and sisters, prepare yourself to be a true disciple for Christ. And being able to withstand the persecution and the mockery and the false allegations and the hatred of the world around you. And don't hate them back, but behave like Christ as a peacemaker and a man and a woman of love to bring them to the glory of Christ. I've had so many instances in my life, especially in the workplace. There was one person, another chair of a department, really kind of really wanted to go after me all the time. And when one time my, my big boss who was the head of medicine was looking at me and said, you know what, what you're doing, Sam? He refers to me, Sam. He said, you're killing him with your kindness. I smiled. The big uh, chief academic officer and the dean told me one day, you know, 
if you can achieve, I told her I'm working on a peace plan with this person, the other department, my department with him. Said if you can achieve that peace plan, plan we'll give you the Nobel Prize uh-huh. for peace. You know what? He became one of my best friends. And he respects this church. And actually, you know, he became one of my best friends. And I pray for him daily to come to know the Lord. And I think, I really want to thank the Lord because it's not I, but Christ that helped me to always turn the other cheek and accept that this is part of my being a disciple of Christ, that I were going to get mockery from people around me, but some of them would ultimately see Christ in the way I react. Look at the history of all the disciples, and I want to, don't want to keep you for long, but look at all the disciples to what happened to them. They stamped their testimony and witness with the blood sacrifice. I can go on and on. You remember James in the book of Acts 12.2, who was basically beheaded by King Herod. Look at Peter. How did he end his life? He was crucified with his head down. Look at other people. Matthew in Ethiopia, who was killed by the sword. John, not only they took him to exile, but they tried to kind of boil him in oil, and they were not successful. They put him basically in that kind of island. James, the brother of Jesus, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. They threw him from the top, from the the pinnacle of the temple, and they smashed him down to the ground, and he he died. Bartholomew and also Nathaniel as missionaries in Asia, they were also both martyred in Armenia, and one of them was flayed, his skin was flayed to death by a whip. Andrew was crucified, again with his head being down. Look at Thomas, doubting Thomas. He went preaching the gospel to India. Can you imagine? And there they killed him with a spear. And the church of India is still alive today because of the witness of that faithful disciple of Christ. Look at Matthias, the apostle chosen to replace the traitor Judas. He was stoned and beheaded. But then what can I say of Luke, where they hanged him in Crete? in in Greece. And look at Mark, who ran away, and we thought that he was a coward, what he did in Egypt. But they crawled him on the floor, and they ultimately killed him after they mutilated his body. But ultimately, Paul, the apostle Paul, who stood for Christ till the last minute, and they beheaded him in Rome after the fire of Rome. This is the calling of the disciples of Christ. Be a disciple. Be a man or woman who would follow Christ and who is willing to put your blood at stake. This is what would make your life a great witness. And this is what would make Agape, a lighthouse in the city of Houston and to the furthest parts of the world. Brothers and sisters, let us bow our head and remember these words. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. O Lord, we humble ourselves before you today. We just kind of love to be in your house and in your presence. O Lord, transform each and every one of us to become a true disciple of Christ. O Lord, cleanse our hearts. Create in us a clean heart, O Lord Jesus Christ. And fill it with your spirit, the spirit of mercy and grace. O Lord, transform us into peacemakers. Reconcilers will bring people to a peace with you and with the people around them. And tremendously, Lord, through your grace, transform us to become your disciples who are willing to withstand all persecution and insults and attacks and false statements against us because of you, O Lord Jesus Christ, to reflect your light in a dying and dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.